health. Yeah. So men, as yeah. you know, powerful oppressors that you all are, are currently expected to live three years less than women. Is that which, UK? That's UK, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is a kind of bizarre, you know, I, I've not heard before of another oppressor class who lives less long than the people that are oppressing. Um, yeah. But expect the life expectancy gap between men and women to balance by 2032. Okay. I don't want that. Go on. <laughs> I, I, think, I think that there are certain um, reasons why men die earlier. And in, in parts, I think that should change. In other parts, I think it shouldn't change. So, for example, I think men are more risk takers and they do bring themselves into stupid situations. And I think we should have the right to bring ourselves into stupid situations. If the only way to accomplish gender parity um, when it comes to longevity, if the only way to reach that is to make our society cont completely controlled and safe, then I don't want it. Um, I think that there should be far more health checks for men. I think that the attitude should be different instead of. Um, Instead of therapy, you should just call it maintenance and you should say, hey guys, your body is like a car. <laughs> your car, you should let, look after your, uh, after your body, not because it's a sign of weakness. It's a, it's a way to stay strong. It's a way to keep up your, your, your might, your manliness. I think there should be a different approach, especially when it comes to mental health. We need a completely different approach to men's mental health. But I'm not worried about women and men living the same amount, the, the same length, as long as both are happy and of mm. choices. Uh, so just to just to um, clarify, Philip, you're saying that calling men toxic isn't good for their mental health. <laughs> no, it's um, well, no. My uh, my old sociology lecturer, uh, you know, God bless him, he was a, he's, he's a fantastic one. Unfortunately, um, I wasn't able to stay at that college because they only did the first two years of the degree. Um, but he used to to talk about the the fact that there is no biological reason for men to die younger. You know, you're saying obviously social re reasons like risk taking. Well, yeah. but but a lot of a lot of people actually think that men die younger. As a biological thing, you know, I thought that. I thought it was a, um, you know, because men are more susceptible to many diseases. You know, I mean, COVID for one example. No, um, it's it. It shouldn't be there. There's no. There's no reason within their DNA that they should die younger. Um, but, mm -hmm. but they do because, as Philip That's said, the risk takers they they damage their bodies when they do uh, dangerous work, and you know that will affect them in later life. They commit more suicide. There's also a, a lack of funding for health issues, be they physical or mental. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Men go to the doctor less. Again, I I I don't want to force men constantly to the doctor, no. but yeah. No, you don't want to nanny them, but you know it should be it should be encouraged because there's clearly ramifications of it not happening. But I mean, you know, my my sociology lecturer used to say, if women were dying between three to five years earlier than men, there would be you know questions asked in Parliament. What the hell is going wrong with our society? If there's no biological reason, women are definitely suffering somewhere along this this the system. Um, yeah. Whereas men, you know, die and it's, it's just accepted as, as, as a fact of life. You know, it's, it's one of those things that the, um, linguistically, most words are male by default and then the uh, female is, is uh, an appendage of that. So that, you know, you get actor and actress, waiter and waitress. Um, but when it comes to widow, it's the male that is, is the, um, the unusual one, widow and widower. Because mm -hmm. widowers are far less frequent. True. Mm -hmm. Wow. 
Never thought about that. That's a, that's a great point. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, we're talking about men accounting for 97% of workplace fatalities. And that has, that has diminished significantly since say the eighties to be fair. And that's a good thing. Um, you know, and we know that they put themselves into riskier jobs, you know, partly because they want to earn good money to attract a good wife. Um, you know, the fact that suicide is the leading cause of death for men under 45. Well, you know, I, I looked this up a while back and, you know, the suicide rate for men has barely changed in a hundred years. So, wow. you know, the rate, the rate or, but the amount has changed, I assume. Oh, no, the amount has changed, yeah, but the rate hasn't changed the percentage. Um, you know, but there is, as far as I know, you know, the only gendered mental health support available on the NHS is for women who have postnatal depression, which is obviously very important, you know, that that service is there. But, you know, if women were... Is it seventy five percent of suicides? Yes. Um, yes. Then there would be a targeted support system there, you know, which there isn't for men. Although, you know, saying that, you know, based on the experiences of male friends of mine who've looked for support for their mental health issues, you know, <laughs> I don't know if they're missing out on much anyway, to be honest. Mm. Um, I, I, at, I attended a, a suicide course here in Scotland. I had to. And I was very interested, obviously. And it was horrible. They, they did, which was good, they did highlight that men um, commit suicide more often. But the whole course, you could tell, was very... It had an incredibly female energy. Um, there were trigger warnings in the beginning. And as soon as they mentioned trigger warnings, I was incredibly triggered and I was already sweating because I'm like, Oh, I can't even be honest here. We can't talk about things. And that's exactly what it turned out to be. Um, instead of really talking about the reasons for suicide, we talked about terminology that you shouldn't say committing suicide. That you should say finalizing suicide or something like that so that was like that was what we were talking about and then we had these like little papers and you had to put them into place and the next day or two days later i was talking to one of my um my customers and he went to a suicide course several years ago and it was the complete opposite it was incredibly masculine and instead of talking long about stuff like this is how you deal with a person that is struggling. This is how you talk them down from, from a bridge. This is how you, um, how you connect to people. And I think that might be a little bit too masculine, but the other thing is definitely feminine. And I think, I think if you want to help male victims understand men, what men need um a co like last year i called ptsd hotline in london because i was looking for somebody who suffered from PTSD. and it was a young girl that answered the hotline and, and this might sound wrong or bad but i thought if i was suffering from ptsd and i was a soldier or something like that i I wouldn't want to talk to a young girl. No. I want to talk to somebody who can understand me. And I know not only men suffer from PTSD, but I think it's absolutely okay that domestic abuse helplines have female counselors. That's how it should be. I think that for men that suffer from PTSD, you need a man who can understand that. What do you think? I think it would help if there were, you know, operators of both sexes. And the first question when someone got through was, are you comfortable talking to 
me as a man or woman or would you prefer to be handed over to someone of the opposite sex to be honest because I find people vary wildly in, in these things you know both men and women can be more comfortable talking with men and or women I agree. Um, you know I think that you know if there is anybody listening out uh, listening into this, you know, who is suicidal, I would recommend the Calm hotline, actually, because I saw someone from Calm delivering a talk and he explained that their operators have two different, you know, they're trained to deal with men and women in different ways. And so, you know, most women call up wanting to have a cry and a talk and a, isn't this really awful, I really feel your pain kind of thing, whereas men call up and what they want more often than not is an action plan of this, you know, these you need to take to try and get yourself out of this position. Um, you know, the other thing about, you know, suicide in men, I think, is that actually a lot of the time they have pretty good reason. And if women were exposed to the kind of disadvantages that men are, then they might do the same thing. And so, you know, I'm thinking particularly about, you know, how the divorce rate, um, sorry, the suicide rate increases for men only after divorce. And yeah. I think that's just because, you know, they've lost their partner. I think a lot of times it's because they suddenly lose meaningful access to their children. Yeah. And, and, so, they're, and yeah. they're, they're, they are under Im, Im, immense financial pressure. And the, the thing is, once you've been through that, obviously you could build a new life, but it's really difficult to build a new life once the first version has been destroyed and then you're afraid of actually start new. And, and it's much more difficult to find somebody new, like a new wife, if you still have children and if you have to so, so much to your old relationship, really difficult. Yeah. How, how do you start fresh? And, you know, men are not always paying for their children. I've got a friend who um, split up with his wife, won full custody of the children and still got a bill for her maintenance. And so he was struggling to provide for their children because he was paying her to live in their old house and, yeah. you know, maintain the lifestyle to which she'd become accustomed. Yeah. I hate How that bloody phrase. You know, <laughs> as, as if, you know, it's, it's like as, as if when you have divorce, that men uh, typically get the lifestyle to which they were accustomed. <laughs> Very good. So, like, well, I mean, I, I assume the men were typically accustomed to being a father. You know, I assume losing that is is quite traumatic. Yeah. Um. It's yeah. I I, I just I hate that that presumption. Um. No, I, I like I I don't know if anybody remembers. It was a long time ago, but the um Sargon of Akkad made a video where it was basically it was just an essay. It was a short story about you know twenty minutes long, and he was just reading from it. And it's, it's a really depressing um, kind of uh, look into a, a not too distant future. And it's, it's a little bit exaggerated, you know, to, to, for poignancy. But it's basically about a man who's working a kind of everyday desk job and he gets bullied by his female boss. And, you know, it, there's, there's little mentions of things like um, women getting longer breaks to make up for the wage gap, um, women getting, you know, more money to make up for the wage gap. When he um, protests to his boss, his boss is like, are you shouting at me? You know, this is harassment. Um, and so he goes to HR, uh, the, the human resources, and the women are in HR are like, I don't understand. You're a man. How can you possibly be bullied by a woman? And yeah. he, he goes home and he receives a letter that says, you have been tried um, in absentia uh, of, of uh, b being a father for for uh, for this woman you know you you have been designated as the father of this baby so um you're going to now have to give up a percentage of your wage 
Yeah. Um, and, and so he takes a noose and he commits suicide. And the last thing that goes through his head is how he could ever be so cruel to women. Wow. <laughs> That sounds incredibly depressing. Please send me the link. <laughs> I'll try to find it, but as you know, Sargon has a few videos. Yeah. 